as well. Today, we have the pleasure of having Belina von Krosig from the University of Hamburg. Belina did her PhD in Snow Plus, and then she moved to Vancouver, UBC, UBC and Tryon for working on Super CDMS at Snow Lab. She was analysis coordinator from 2018 and 2020. Uh, since 2019, she's a uh, research group leader at the University of Hamburg, working in Super CDMS and uh, in Darwin since uh, 2020. The research group is focusing on low mass dark matter searches, such as dark photons, ALPS, and like dark matter. And she's also working on the online and offline trigger as well as the entire DAQ um, software. So, Belina, whenever you're ready, uh, she, today we talk about the low mass dark matter searches at Super CDMS. Yeah, thank you very much so both for, for the invitation and the nice introduction. Um, and yeah, so like, uh, like Valentina just said, so this presentation is really basically going to be about my research within uh, Super CDMS. Um, but before we, we get there, really, let me start with the, with the why. Why Super CDMS? Why searching for, for dark matter in the first place? And the answer is, um, well, <clears throat> there is a huge amount of evidence that dark matter exists. And I won't go into the details of all of them or even show all of them, even in a broad stroke, but I want to give you at least a one, uh, one piece of evidence that I personally find one of the prettiest or the most picturesque um, uh, piece of evidence for, for the existence of dark matter. And what you're seeing here on this, this figure, so I really like this figure because it's, it seems like a, a um, sky of stars, but it really is a sky of galaxies. So um, that's to me in itself already amazing that we can make these pictures and you see really galaxy, entire galaxy clusters. Uh, so you can see one, one here and you can see a smaller one here. And those two galaxy clusters they have actually crossed each other. So they, they were um, moving towards each other, crossing each other, and now they are, they are going away from each other. And so, so you typically also talk of a galaxy cluster collision. And in this collision, you, you have a lot of mass and, and a lot of matter that is involved there, right? So you have the planets, you have uh, the stars, uh, but you also have a huge amount of, of dust uh, that is in these galaxy clusters. And when matter crosses each other, there's a lot of uh, ordinary interactions going on, a, a lot of electromagnetic interaction and such that really slows uh, the matter down as it passes each other. And when you then ask the question, okay, after these two galaxy clusters have crossed each other, where do you find most of the matter? And the answer can be given via X-ray telescopes, for example, that will show you that, okay, what is really shining up here is this pink region. This is um, where you find most of what I would call ordinary matter. So the matter that you and I are made of, really the standard model of, um, particle matter that, that we are having. And yeah, this is, this is where you find it. And then the next question would be, well, uh, matter has mass. Um, so let's check where we find most of the mass. And you can do this and uh, this coupling this from, from this uh, X-ray pictures if you take gravity into the equation. So if you ask via gravitational measurements like rotational lensing, where in this picture do you find most of the mass really? You will find it in these, um, in these blue areas. And that's actually quite surprising, right? So if there is uh, only ordinary matter, the mass should be where the matter is. So this tells us um, it cannot be only ordinary matter that we are having. There must be something we are not seeing. And that's why we're calling this dark matter. There must be some matter that is not shining up in our X-ray telescopes, or there's matter that we don't just, uh, just see via our um, standard model measurement techniques. Um, there must be something that is dark and that is heavy, that is creating mass, uh, that is pulling the mass distribution away from where most of the ordinary matter can be seen. The next question is, okay, well, there is something that we call dark matter, but is this a big effect? Is it a small effect? How much is there really? And there are measurements that can give you this, uh, this information and the result of those um, measurements is that really 85% of all matter is dark. 
So that's that's not a small effect, right? So that's basically telling us that the matter that we are understanding so well with the standard model of particle physics, that matter is really just 15, about 15% 15 of all matter that we have. And that really calls for an answer. We want to understand what this uh, dark matter is made from. And then you can um, also use this big number. It is telling you, okay, dark matter is very abundant um, in our universe. And let's uh, let's zoom in to our galaxy. And don't use the entire universe. We are sitting um, in the Milky Way. So let's focus um, just on our galaxy. This is a, an artist's impression here um, of the Milky Way, which is sitting in this huge dark matter halo. And we are sitting somewhere, somewhere here on, on one of these arms. And so when we know, well, there's a lot of dark matter around us, um, we, we have it present. So why don't we just uh, put in a detector and see what is flying through our detectors and see whether it's giving us uh, some kind of signals. So that's a basic idea of what we call direct dark matter detection. We are looking for direct interaction of, of dark matter that is anyway existing already. So we are not trying to create it, we are using what is around us. And we are looking into our detectors, what's going on there. And if you zoom into our detectors, our detectors, so whatever material they're made from, they in the end consist of atoms uh, with a nucleus and with some electrons. And then you can basically, in terms of direct dark matter detection, what you're looking for is, for example, um, let's start with the red one, dark matter coming in here recoiling off the nucleus and yeah, creating a nuclear recoil really that we can observe. And then the dark matter continues its way. So this is dark matter nucleus scattering. Or dark matter could also come in and actually recoil off an electron. So in this case, you would have dark matter electron scattering and you could observe the electron recoil. Or another option would be that dark matter is coming in and is being absorbed and an electron is being emitted. And then we could again observe the electron. So basically direct dark matter detection is really any direct interaction with the atoms of the material. And I'm, I'm saying this explicitly here because typically people have in mind for direct dark matter detection, it's WIMP nucleus scattering, but that's just one of the many options. So the WIMP coming in here, which is one of the dark matter particle candidates scattering off a nucleus, but that's not all we can search for. So that's really an important message any interaction that you can think of that you can come up with a dark matter candidate and a, a coupling um, to any of our standard model particles, that's something we are, we are aiming for. And just to put this um, yeah, in, in perspective with the standard model, so basically what I'm saying here is, well, we know the standard model and we have a nice theory for this. And we have, um, yeah, something we know is there, some matter that is made off from, from particles most likely. And we could basically build something that looks like the standard model, but it's, since it's unknown and not visible, we call it dark sector. And it could be made from yeah, different candidates. So really this is, you see a lot of question marks here. I mentioned already one of the typical um, candidates is the weakly interacting massive particle. So this is a dark matter candidate, but you could also consider a lighter version of a WIMP, which is uh, sometimes referred to as light dark matter. We, these here would be similar to, to our uh, matter particles over here, but we could also have dark bosons. Um, so in this case, you could consider just like the standard model photon, you could consider a dark photon with the big difference being that A, it has a mass uh, or it can have a mass uh, really. And it is not uh, electromagnetically coupling to anything, um, but it could kinetically mix with the standard model photon in this way for example, these two sectors could be connected. Maybe that's, uh, that's a connection, but there could also be other connections. And really just finding any probing as many connections that there could be as possible is, is one of the big goals. So basically what I'm saying here, even if typically direct dark matter search experiments are, search, are searching for WIMS and coupling in some way with a standard model, this should not limit you to only look for this um, because there are many more candidates and many more uh, coupling options. And if you have an experiment that can do more than one, you should really always look for more than one potential channel, right? And that's exactly what SuperCDMS is, is doing. 
And that basically uh, brings me to super CMS itself. And I also want to tell you what the experiment is really um, like, but let me first uh, just introduce you to our collaboration where you can see here a picture, which is actually at, at UBC while I did my, my postdoc. And you can see that um, many of these institutes here are Northern American institutes, but we do have, um, we have some uh, Indian colleagues and we have one theory institute at UK. And you, we have uh, since 2019 now with my group also one institute at, at Germany. So we're growing more international and we are something like, I don't know, 120-ish uh, people right now. But there's quite some history to, to Super CMS. So Super CMS has a past that reaches back to the 90s. And in the 90s, it was basically, it was a small setup um, at Sudan, uh, sorry, not Sudan, at Stanford, at an underground uh, facility, which is very, very shallow. So just 10 meters underground. And yeah, it was um, the detectors that were being used were made from germanium. They were the exposure that was being collected was in a kilogram day um, region. And this was actually quite a successful start. Uh, the concept, the detector concept made sense. It was very promising. So the next step was to do two things grow bigger, so make bigger detectors, more detectors, so you can collect more data, but also go to a deeper site. So that's, um, yeah, going, basically going to Sudan. And the next step would be, okay, this was successful as well. That was going very well. And there was some um, um, heavy R&D going on during CDMS2. And this R&D led to a new detector design, which in the end uh, yeah, was the birth basically of the new name Super CDMS. This is still at the Sudan lab, um, but again, more exposure. So this is now kilogram year, not kilogram days anymore. And then after this was decommissioned in 2015, we are now moving to our next generation. And this is Super CDMS at Snow Lab. And Snow Lab, as uh, many of you in the audience, of course, know this is um, really deep. And yeah, well, this is uh, of course the, the key point uh, going deep here, but the next thing we are doing is of course, again, increasing our exposure. So making bigger detectors, making more detectors and already planning for the next uh, generation. So right now we are building the experiment to take data between 23 and 27, but we are already planning the next generation. So there will also be really a future of Super CMS at Snow Lab. And let me just remind you, I know there, there are many, many experts in the audience, but still for completeness, uh, let me remind you about the why going so deep. Um, so this is here, you see on the y-axis, the muon flux. And if dark matter can pass through our detectors and uh, do any interaction with our detectors, so can muons and all their secondaries. And the flux of muons, of course, on the surface is super, super high, and we would be buried in backgrounds. And that's why Super CMS uh, quickly went deep to, to Sudan, but now it's going all the way down to, to Snow Lab, um, which is really the deepest underground lab. Jinping is deeper, but it's, uh, sorry, underground um, a clean room lab. So Jinping is, is deeper, but it's not, uh, not a clean room to that level that is really required. And yeah, just um, also this is, is certainly familiar, but let me just um, point out. So yeah, reminding people of really a depth of, of about two kilometers and just show you the position of Super CMS. So I know that many of you are working on Snow Plus, which is here. Super CMS is being installed in the letter labs and you can see some construction going on there. And this picture is already outdated again. So this is our platform here. This is really the, the main site for, for our experiment. And well, um, yeah, for those of you who have been doing shifts, you know that this is really normally when you come down here, this, this shaft here, you see uh, the, the elevator. This is really early in the morning. So you go along here in the early, early morning, sometimes 6, 6 a.m. And then you go have your shower, you go into the clean room. And so the first thing you should know about a snow lab is where to find a coffee. So this is... Um, yeah, basically the first step. And then after some time you can, can go to your experiment site. And the experiment site is again, it's a letter lab. And so let's, let's zoom in there to take a closer look what we are building there. So super CDMS is mostly um, this green 
tank here, which is really a cryostat. And I will zoom into the cryostat in a bit, but I want to focus also on this thing that we call CUTE, which is our cryogenic underground test facility. And CUTE is a smaller version sort of of, um, of super CDMS. So for super CDMS, the installation is ongoing as we speak, but with uh, CUTE, we are already taking data. So CUTE is commissioned, we have detectors in there, and we can characterize our detectors, we can probe um, uh, detector designs. And once we are done there, we can actually, once uh, super CMS is done, move them over and give ourselves a head start this, this way. So CUTE is, uh, is taking data, and we have a strong um, R&D program in Super CMS. And I just want to highlight one R&D program, which is called HVEV. And this, this uh, word, HVEV, will come up uh, in, in some later slides. But I just want to point out that these detectors, they, for example, can already be installed in Qt and data can be taken there. But coming back to the heart of Super CMS. So I said, this is a cryostat. So let's take a look at the cryostat. You can see a picture um, of, of this cryostat here. You can see the size of the cryostat. So this is really a big, uh, big cryostat for those of you with experience um, um, with cryostats will appreciate uh, that size. But also it's, it's cooling down to chilly below 15 millikelvin. So just keeping in mind that the entire universe is at something like 2.6 Kelvin. This really is telling you that the cryostat is something like 200 times colder than the entire universe. So this is really, really a cool uh, spot to, to sit in. And what we have in there are six detectors, here shown in bigger, stacked in one tower. And then we have, for the initial payload, we have four of these towers. So they will be sitting in here. Four, uh, four of them, but there is space for more towers. And this is what I was saying. We are already anticipating um, a time of super city mass post the first um, couple of years uh, starting in 2023. Now these detectors here, they are um, yeah, about a kilogram. So they are either from silicon, in which case they would be a little a bit less heavy than one kilogram or from germanium, in which case they would be a little bit heavier than one kilogram. And they are about the size of an ice hockey puck, if, if you will. And these detectors here, again, they are, they are cooled down. And when you cool them down, there's two types of signal we can observe with them. So one type of signal is actually independent really of the cooling um, is ionization. So you have an interaction, you have, for example, a nuclear recoil or an electron recoil, like I described in the beginning, and you generate electron hole pairs. So you ionize basically, but you can also have uh, what we call phonons. So in the end, um, what is really happening is you have a particle coming in there, scattering off an electron or a nucleus and depositing heat or creating vibrations. So vibrations and heats um, that's, that's sort of uh, analog to each other. And these vibrations in a crystal are quantized. And for that purpose, we are calling them phonons. So they are quasi particles, those uh, quantized vibrations that we call phonons. And since the detector is so cold, uh, we can actually see those tiny, tiny heat increases due to deposited energy. Now, when you have an electron recoil, you have a lot of ionization, right? There's electromagnetic interaction, so you cause a lot of ionization, so you have um, a lot of energy going into your ionization signal. If you have a nuclear recoil, you have typically much, much, much less ionization and for the same amount of energy that went into the phonon signal. So what this uh, plot is telling you is that if you have in an electron recoil, <clears throat> you have a high fraction of ionization, a small fraction of a phonon. <clears throat> if you have a nuclear recoil, same energy deposition, you have a high contribution of phonons and very small contribution of electrons. And this, uh, this uh, basically allows you to discriminate quite nicely between nuclear recoil events and electron recoil events. So you could just draw a line here and say, okay, everything that is below that was a nuclear recoil event. So it could have been the nuclear scattering, or it could be up here, um, light dark matter electron scattering. So this is why these detectors, if you measure both the phonons and the charge, give you a very, very nice um, discrimination between event types. 
But there's also another trick we are playing. So we have another type of detector. So these guys on the left here, we call IZIP detectors. But we have also some detectors that we call high voltage detectors. And in this case, they only have a phonon channel. So we are not collecting the charge uh, information or the charge uh, itself anymore, but just the phonons. And we really plaster the, the surface here with a high density of, of sensors and can strongly reduce our energy threshold. Now this picture doesn't tell you yet how, how the high voltage is actually doing, doing the trick. So let me walk you through the, the effect that is going on here. So this is again our high voltage detector and this is a picture of it. And just imagine you have any kind of particle going in here and recoiling off a nucleus or an electron. Then you generate, again, you generate primary phonons. So you have them right there and you generate electron hole pairs. Now, if you apply a voltage, and for us, high voltage means something like 100 volts, 150 volts. Um, when you do that, the electrons and the holes, uh, they want to go to the respective electrode. So they are being accelerated. If you were in vacuum, they would just accelerate to their final ve velocity and be happy. But we are in a crystal, right? So the, the electrons and the holes, they cannot just uh, go to their final velocity because they will soon hit another atom in, in the lattice. And when this is happening, you create additional vibrations. So that is exactly what the trick we are playing here. We, we apply a very high voltage that would, or that gives energy to the electron and hole pairs that they can't really uh, go and get put into kinetic energy really, but they have to dissipate to the lattice via additional vibrations. They really want to, to go to the other sides. There's atoms, they are kicking them additional vibrations, which means additional phonons. So that is the trick here. We are actually with these high voltage detectors, we are still measuring the electron hole pair signal, but we are measuring it in phonons. We are converting basically the electron hole pair signal into a much, much larger phonon signal. And then the next question is, okay, when we are doing this trick, how low can we really go with this idea? So how few can the electron hole pairs be that we can see? And for this, I will take you to our R&D program because there you start when you're trying something new, you're starting not with a big detector, but you're going smaller. Um, and really this is what, what we did here. We have a small chip, so this is now not one kilogram anymore but something like, like a gram. So um, this is a gram scale detector. It's one by one centimeter. It's four millimeters thick. So really, really a small thing. And you have only phonon sensors on top of here. And now when you want to, to uh, know what you're getting, you typically you send something in where you exactly know what the source is. And exactly knowing the source can be achieved with a laser. So we basically, we chose a laser and the laser has a, a um, wavelength of about 650 nanometers, which is in energy about 1.9 electron volts. Now that's an interesting or the right energy for, for a reason. So this is, by the way, this is a silicon uh, chip and the silicon band gap is at about 1.2-ish electron volts. So 1.9 electron volts um, in terms of uh, photon energy sent by the laser is just enough to liberate one electron hole pair. That's uh, basically why we chose this energy to always get one electron hole pair from the photon that is being sent in. Now you can tune your laser and say, okay, we want to have one photon at a time. So if you send in one photon, there's just enough energy to liberate one electron hole pair, you should get that one electron hole pair. But a laser is typically a stochastic process. So you're not really getting one photon all the time, but you are getting a Poisson distribution with a lambda of one photon. Um, and this is what is shown here in green. And this is really just a Poisson distribution that you can, can calculate with a lambda of one photon. And then we took our data. In this case, we had applied 150 volts and the data is what is shown in black. And you see, we are really getting back what we are sending in via the laser. So this on its own is already great. But um, yeah, just to, to show you really the beauty of this measurement, 
So what is shown here, we are measuring phonon energy. But uh, again, the phonon energy is originally coming from an electron hole pair. And starting here, so this is the, the other x-axis that I'm showing. What we are seeing here is one electron hole pair, two electron hole pairs, three electron hole pairs, and so on. So this plot is showing you two things. First of all, we are with this little device, we are sensitive to the lowest possible ionization signal, a single electron hole pair. And on top of that, the resolution of this device is so high that we can even distinguish the individual peaks. So we can see the one peak uh, distinguished from the two electron hole pair peaks and so on. So this is an ultra low threshold that is being achieved with a very, very high resolution. And so this is, uh, with this device, we can actually not only do R&D, but do a little bit of dark matter search. So let me just give you a recap of detectors because I walked through three different kinds of detectors and it's a lot to, to take in. So the first one were these ISIP detectors or default detectors for super CMS snow lab of about one kilogram silicon or germanium. We read out both the phonon and ionization and can effectively discriminate between electron recoil and nuclear recoil. Then we have those high voltage detector, same thing, but we only use uh, the phonon um, readout and we, yeah, we, we, we ignore basically the, the ionization direct information, but we amplify the phonon, um, the, the charge signal via phonon. And then we have a very low threshold this way. And the, the third one I was mentioning is the H3EV. And you now might recognize the h 3 h 3 ev And this is high voltage allowing us to go, let me go back here, all the way down to the EV scale. So that is why we are um, talking about h 3 ev And this is a similar principle to h 3 but it is an R&D detector. It is small, it's one gram only, and it's uh, made from silicon at this point. We don't have a germanium version of it right now. Now, coming to the fun part, the dark matter searches, I mentioned we can look for nuclear recoil and electron recoil. And the main channel for super CMS really is actually WIMP nuclear scattering, just like I said at the beginning. Um, but it is super exciting actually to also look at the other channels and you could search for light dark matter electron scattering and absorption of axon-like uh, particles and dark photons and such. And this is typically the regime where you are sensitive to lighter dark matter. And the reason is, is simple, especially for the scattering. When you have a particle that is very heavy knocking off something that is um, lighter. You will see a nicely a recoil. That's, that's kinematically super simple. If you have something very, very light, um, trying to hit something like a heavy nucleus, you won't uh, see the recoil really. At some point, it is just uh, the movement is so small that we can't see it anymore. The electron instead is, of course, it's much lighter than a nucleus. And if light dark matter that is too light to really have an effect on a nucleus is hitting an electron, we can again see it. So this is a, this is the channel that allows us to go to even lower masses, and one of the channels I'm I'm heavily invested in. And also absorption is uh, very sensitive, um, or has the ability to go to very light masses, and you are observing an electron recoil. And these are the two channels, so the light dark matter electron scattering and the absorption that I want to walk you through. Starting with the light dark matter electron scattering. So first of all, what you want to know is, okay, if I was to calculate, to simulate a spectrum, how does it actually look? So what are we seeing in the end in our detector? And this is a calculation. Um, so there's an online tool you can use. So this is, there's a lot of nuclear physics um, going in here. And so we are using that uh, the tool that is existing. And you see for, for example, 500 MeV uh, mass of a light dark matter particle in silicon, you see a certain spectral shape here. And I want to really focus on the X axis because this is telling you the amount of energy that is being deposited. And we are here in the electron volt regime. So even if you're not uh, working on this type of um, experiments, um, I can, can tell you that this is very, very low because for example, for super CDMS Sudan, so our past experiment, the lowest threshold we ever achieved was 56 EV. 
And this was really a breakthrough back then. It was really the lowest uh, achieved ever uh, publication, yay, and so on. But you can see that even with this, um, well, you're just not sensitive to any of this. So this is beyond uh, this, this plot even. So with the Supersima Sudan and detectors, we were just not able to search for, for this kind of light dark matter. With this little R&D device I just showed you, we are going down all the way to one electron volt in threshold. And you can now see that even with a tiny mass of detectors, so this is much smaller than this guy over here, but um, it is in contrast to the big one here, it's not blind to this channel anymore. It can actually see the entire spectrum. It is sensitive to the whole um, expected spectrum that, uh, that you see here. So this is something um, yeah, that allows us, even with this tiny device, to search for dark matter. I also mentioned um, that this device uh, is, or I showed you the, the figure really, I showed you the data that we can actually resolve the, the positions in individual electron hole pairs. So we are not seeing a continuous uh, spectrum like here, but we actually have to trans, uh, translate this uh, energy here into single electron hole pairs. So you apply a certain ionization model that is giving you the answer. And then your, your spectrum looks something like this in electron hole pairs. Now, this is something we can work with. And this is something we can use and compare it with our data and set actual limits. And this is what's been done here. You see in red and in blue, two different uh, data taking runs we did with HVEV. And you see, to a couple of things actually. So the first run, um, HVEV run one is red one. And you see, first of all, there's a lot of data going on there. So there's no laser of course applied. This is just really the detector sitting there and waiting. And still there's a lot of uh, stuff going on. Um, and then going to HVEV run two, the rate hasn't really changed much, but the resolution got much better. So there was an improvement um, and we could improve the resolution of this device even further. And now once you have this data, we don't know, at this point, we don't have a background model. So we, we have some idea, we are working hard on getting really a full picture of the backgrounds that go in here. But as long as we don't have this, this model, we just make the, the most robust thing you can do and, and say is, okay, we, we don't try to discover at this point. We just try to say, what is um, the cross section we can exclude? So this is really, I'm um, saying, um, let's let's take the, the blue spectrum and say, okay, all of it is dark matter. If this was the case, what cross section refers to to that um, uh, to that dark matter data? And then basically, you you fit your dark matter signal model. So this is what we just had on the previous slide. And you try to to scale it such that it would have been observed was the cross section higher. So had we had a higher cross section such that this peak here was, was like so, we can say it's not in our data. The cross section can't be so high that this peak is growing more. So this way we can calculate an exclusion limit. And this is what we did with just really half a gram day of data. So this is what in our first um, science uh, back in 2018, we, in the end we had half a gram day of, of data just putting this into perspective with Super CNS Snow Lab, where we are talking about kilogram years of data. This is half a gram day of data. And we were able back then, so the red one were, were our results for light dark matter electron scattering to carve out new parameter space all over here. And for those of you familiar with uh, experiments like Xenon, they're really large. They have um, they have also a kilogram um, day exposure, really. They have a lot of data here, but they are limited by the threshold. So the ionization for us in, in silicon, the lowest possible energy deposition is again about one EV that we can resolve. For xenon, it's something like 11 or 12 EV, the lowest, um, the threshold basically for the lowest for the single electron. Um, Ionization or the single ionization. So that's even if xenon is growing larger and larger, they will never be able to get into this, this region. And this is what makes these types of devices so powerful. So that's uh, one direction um, where we are working on, so the light dark matter electron scattering. Then I mentioned already this, uh, this other um, channel where we are basically absorbing dark matter. And 
I'm generally talking about the dark boson absorption because remember the dark sector picture I was showing you, there was a dark photon, there was an axon-like particle, they're both uh, bosons, and you can basically apply the same search for both of these kinds um, of, of dark bosons. And the idea is pretty simple. So we all know the photoelectric effect. You have uh, just, just ignore what has been written here for now, just assume this is a standard model photon that is coming in here. And then you have an electron that is being emitted. And uh, when you measure the energy of the electron, you know the incoming energy of, uh, you know the, the energy of the incoming photon. So that's a photoelectric effect. Now you can play the same game, but with an axon-like particle or a dark photon that basically or uh, effectively in the end, um, yeah, couples to the electron. So it, this is a little bit, uh, let's say, a black box. There's more going on here. But effectively, you have a dark boson coming in here and an electron emitted with the energy of the incoming particle. Now, in this case, remember, we are sitting in the dark matter halo in our, um, yeah, in our galaxy. So what we are looking at is cold dark matter. So what is uh, surrounding us is cold dark matter which means most of the energy or really all of the energy that the incoming boson is having, if you're assuming all of the dark matter that is surrounding us is made from this boson, is mass energy. So this is telling us that when we measure the electron energy, we know what mass was coming in here from the boson. And that's, that's actually a pretty neat um, measurement and pretty straightforward. And if you were to just uh, simulate uh, such a signal, what you do is you have, a, for example, a 10 electron volt dark photon or axon-like particle. And again, um, we would get a deposited energy of just the same number. So 10 EV uh, mass would result in 10 EV deposited energy. And then this would be a line, but the detector resolution smears it all. So this is just following your detector resolution. And then you're searching basically for a peak in your data. And then it's also pretty obvious in this case that when you go, um, say here is the super CMS snow lab um, design threshold. When you go up to the threshold, down to the threshold, that's, um, sorry, that's uh, all the mass you can get. If you lower your threshold, you directly get access to more lighter dark matter or dark boson um, candidates. So that's another thing really, um, Trying to get a low threshold is not only super interesting for light dark matter electron scattering, where all the signal is at low masses, um, at low energies, but also for this channel, because the moment you go to lighter, to lower, to better thresholds, you get more um, mass of space, basically, that you can probe. And um, you know, one thing that I also want to, to highlight here is that basically um, the calculation in this case, it's, um, well, it is directly proportional to the photoelectric cross-section. So this is what I just said, it's sort of um, piggybacks on our standard model idea of the photoelectric cross-section. And it um, adjusts it by taking the local dark matter density into account. So had we more um, dark matter around us, we would have a higher rate, was there less, we would have less and so on. And then it also scales with the coupling of the incoming boson to the standard model. And this is basically a, the, the rate calculation that, that you do effectively. And just again, um, yeah, well, not again, I haven't really mentioned it. The, the photoelectric cross section really plays a role here because um, it enters here directly and it is basically a systematic uncertainty that we have to account for. But the other take home message from this slide really is the lower the threshold, the greater the mass range. And that's what we are working hard on to basically get the maximum out of our detectors. And just to bring this uh, to comparison, we did a search. This is just an example for the axon-like particles. We also did the same search for dark photons. And with the Sudan detectors, so the, the big ones uh, from our past uh, version of Super CMS, it goes has a very wide span of masses here from something like uh, 300, uh, 400 kV all the way down um, to here, and I'll jump to the other plot here. This is basically this, this end here um, to, yeah, a few tenths of EV. 
And then this H3EV device with a much lower threshold can cover all this extra parameter space. So now the goal is for us to basically stitch these, these two together. So it's, that's why it's R&D, right? It's not trivial to scale this one up, um, but that's really our goal so that we can in the end, also with our bigger detectors as SuperCMS and Snow Lab, go all the way down here to the lowest possible mass. Now there's one way, there are many ways to achieve this, but one way um, is of course, to improve the trigger. So when you're not, uh, when your trigger is higher than X, you just don't get um, light dark matter um, of a certain mass. So that's what my group is also heavily invested in is on the trigger system. And this is, yeah, this is uh, basically our, our design, a really custom made um, circuit that is doing our detector control, it's doing our readout, and it's also doing our first level triggering. So the trigger sits on this little FPGA here. And what the trigger is seeing is a phonon pulse. Uh, so we are, for our detectors, for some of them, and then we also read a charge signal. But in all cases, no matter whether or not there's also a charge signal, we always trigger on the phone on pulse. And there is some, some noise, of course, the baseline is um, having some noise. And if you have a high energy deposition, it is really easy to just put a threshold here and say, okay, peak over threshold for a certain amount of time. That's an event, let's read it out. But again, if you want to go to light dark matter masses, if you want to push for the absorption, for example, to go to really light um, masses, we have to, to see how low, this, how small this pulse can be, so we can still read it. But there's also one could just say, well, then, okay, just, just go uh, down here. But of course, you can already see if you go into the noise, you would be triggering all the time on stuff you don't want to trigger on. And just to, to let me zoom in here a little bit, or zooming in is not the right word, a similar set of, of data. This is data taken with our small H3EV device again. So the blue is just, just like before. The blue here is our trace with a phonon pulse. Blue is the trace, the raw trace with a phonon pulse. You can see already this pulse is much smaller. And then this uh, the noise continues. And you see in red, our trigger threshold that we can that we can set the way we want and before we set our trigger threshold we do one uh, one additional step in order to get a less noisy trace so you can see the blue is really it's noisy and you can also see so this is over time here on the x-axis but you can also see that there are different frequencies involved so there's some um that is going like, yeah, slower up and down and up and down again. Then you have those uh, frequencies that are fast going up and down. So basically what we are doing is we are looking at the frequencies in our noise and we, we check, okay, which frequencies are really, really um, prominent in the noise. And we want to filter out only those frequencies. So we are not doing like a, a big filter, and a, 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 like a boxcar filter or a bandpass filter where we filter out a big, very block, really a big chunk of uh, frequencies. But instead we are looking at our noise. We are looking at uh, the frequencies that are most disturbing and we deviate those frequencies. So that's what we are calling an optimal filter because it is optimal for a given noise scenario. We are basically adapting our filter to the noise environment. And when you do this, when you create such an optimal filter and you filter your trace, you get in this case the, here the, the orange trace. And you can see, um, yeah, the, the noise is substantially reduced. The peak of the, the um, um, of your signal is also a little bit uh, um, smaller. So you have to compare background uh, signal over noise to see where is the optimum. But I can tell you that this here is already much, uh, much better. So the orange is, is much better than, than the blue. So then when we have this filtered um, situation, we can see, okay, let's um, place the threshold such that we still get something that could still be a signal here, this tiny peak, but it's high enough. So it's not catching up on all these um, ups and downs here. So. Again, we can't, so this is a continuous trace from our R&D device, but for super CMS as Snow Lab, we can't continuously read out. We have to trigger and we cannot afford to, to trigger on every uh, thing here. There's just some noise uh, fluctuation. 
So we have to find a way to, to optimize this, uh, to, to basically meet our throughput limitations. So let's take the, um, the idea from this slide back to the circuit, back to the, the board and the FPGA trigger. So we are doing basically a similar thing. We have here, and this is just a sketch of our trigger architecture. We have here on the left side, the four on channels. And for those detectors that have charged channels, we have those um, channels, those traces coming in here. They are being downsampled. They are being combined. So basically what we are doing here, we are combining all the channels that we have into, so all phonon channels that is, into a single um, combined channel. Then we apply this optimal filter I just described. And then we start to look, let me go back. This is now the situation here, the, the orange one. And then we see when something is peak over threshold for a certain amount of time. This is what is happening here in the peak search and in the threshold uh, logic. And then the decision is being sent to uh, downstream to the DAC and the data is being acquired if it's being triggered on. Okay, so nice, uh, so, so far so nice. But um, I mentioned we are combining here all our channels. Now we are having 12 channels. And the moment you start to merge things together, you lose information. So instead, um, what, what my group is working on currently is to make this, um, this whole uh, uh, filtering more powerful by not merging all of those 12 phonon channels into one, but keeping them individually. Taking a look at uh, the, the channels, the traces individually, and also allowing for different um, positions in the detector. So basically you are allowing for N channels, in our case 12, and M positions in the detector because there might be some position dependence uh, that you could grasp this way. And basically you can filter more um, powerful this way by keeping this extra information. And so this way you could further reduce the noise. So that's one thing, how you can then lower the threshold. If you reduce the noise, you can lower the threshold. But there's also another trick we can play on top of it. And this is really, really uh, R&D for the, the next generation. So what I just showed you uh, can, be, can be implemented already for this, uh, so 2023 Snow Lab uh, Super CMS. What I'm showing you now is basically for the next generation. So a signal like, again, a signal like phone and pulse uh, could be looking like this purple one. So this is actually, actually um, true data. So this is data we are looking at. Um, it has a rise time, it has a fall time, and then there's noise on top of it. But we also have these kinds of events uh, that we call um, low frequency noise. But really what, what it is, it's, it's some kind of um, additional vibrations that are induced from external that has nothing to do with particle interaction. So we really don't want to have these. But the problem is here, um, you can see if you just have a threshold um, over noise um, trigger, this here, the, the orange one would trigger that, uh, right? So it's, even if you take the duration into, into account, this could be uh, something that could be a high energy pulse and it would trigger the detector. But overall we see, well, um, this is not, uh, in, in many ways, this is not looking like, like a signal. And I could show you many different pictures where this would always look a little bit differently, but always uh, you can say already from the shape, okay, this is looking like external vibrations. Whereas a good uh, physics interaction, particle physics interaction always looks um, like this, sharp rise time, slow fall time. And when you are in such a situation, you can actually use uh, things like machine learning and um, that can discriminate quite nicely between signal-like and background events. And again, background really is here something that is not particle uh, induced, but it's always changing. So you can't really make a, a one template that would be background-like and one template that would be signal-like, but you know what signal looks like. And there are many other things that don't look like signal. And this is something that a machine learning discriminator can do quite, quite well, actually. And nowadays, and there's a nice platform and nice um, or nice tools that we can use and apply for our FPGA firmware that allows us to do machine learning. And so not, not the whole thing, but really the latency space of, of machine learning, the decision can be done on FPGA level. So that would be the next step that allows us to go really low in threshold 
if we can avoid triggering on stuff that we don't want to see and allows us to only trigger or to mostly trigger, it's, it's always, it's never 100% right, but we can really um, make this highly efficient to trigger on signal-like events and ignore those background-like stuff that we don't want to have. And if we can do so, we can really go close to the baseline and avoid uh, reading out all the things we don't want to read out. So this very future uh, R&D um, uh, slide brings me actually to my conclusion. So first of all, um, yeah, I hope I could convince you if you weren't convinced before already that understanding the nature of dark matter is really one of the, the biggest uh, challenges in, in science today. It's not necessarily the, well, it's truly not, not the only one, and, but it's one of the pressing questions that we, we have at hand. And SuperSume Asset Snow Lab offers us a unique chance uh, to probe uncharted uh, territory in the, in the very near future. So again, 2023 is our goal starting date and then many years to come. And as last thing, I would really love to just really encourage everyone, if you have an experiment in hand, if you're working on an experiment, try to really get the most out of it and never hesitate to also pioneer. It might be that this whole, for example, this machine learning FPGA, um, it might be a great success. It might also be that, well, okay, it is, uh, it is not working as well as we were hoping for, but if you don't dare to pioneer, well, we, we won't go to, to the depth we, we really can. So that's basically yeah, my, my conclusion and thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Belina, for this very interesting uh, talk. Any comments or question? Yes, Pedro. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your very nice presentation, Belina, that I learned a lot. I'm not an expert on these direct searches. Uh, uh, would you see the neutrinos or the neutrinos from the sun since you now have so such uh, very good sensitivity? Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, let me bring you to, to the additional. Um, let, let me actually find a better slide that is. Uh, give me a second, better. So yeah, that's that's a little bit better. So the neutrinos um, right now for the next generation for so for the 2023 um, experiment, if you are now here in the dark matter nucleon scattering space, um, so that would be coherent um, neutrino scattering is is starting at about here. Yeah. So with the next generation, so 2023 to 27. These, this shaded area is our reach. So here we won't yet see the neutrinos, but the next generation we are pushing into really into the neutrino um, background here. And this would be the moment when we start to see neutrinos. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rui? Hey, uh, nice talk. Um, can I just ask you, uh, do you present independently the results for electron recoil and for nucleus recoil? So, I mean, yeah. these lines, right? Sorry. The lines that you're just showing in your slides, do you have independent lines? So I'm not entirely sure yet. I'm, I'm, I think I have an answer, but <laughs> let me try to, to understand your question now first. Um, so for the high voltage detectors, um, we can't discriminate electron recoils and nuclear recoils. So they would be basically both together. So in, um, let me go back to um, this here. So in this case here, um, we have both electron recoils and nuclear recoils. We can't distinguish uh, in, in this one, um, if this is your question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and there's no, no way to distinguish them because one is much cleaner than the other. For a phenomenologist, it would be very interesting to, to, uh, to see what's, uh, what were the limits that you would get from one and from the other. Right, but yeah. So we can, well, um, we can basically also do um, get a, a um, limit from this data on the, the nuclear recoil. Um, 
but we would still we would not look for the elastic channels we would look for the inelastic channels so basically we would go back um to the ionization uh, signal because so when you have for example um dark matter scattering and you have some initial state radiation or final state radiation so basically bremsstrahlung um then we would uh, look for the interaction between the photon and the, the electron which would give us a handle on the dark matter nucleon scattering um but not by the elastic uh, dark matter nucleon um uh, interaction okay thank you Thank you. Any other comments or question? Okay, I actually have one. So what so you said that there's complicated to go from the 0 0.5 gram uh, to the, the large scale. So what are the prospectives for for that? So super CDMS when we start in 2023, we use the ISIP and the HV, right? Yeah. So exactly. What is the the perspective for the HVEV? So to well, um, we will. Um, let, there, there are several answers uh, to to the question. So, um, one thing is to basically try to to understand. So the what we are looking at actually, this is the right plot for it. And what is right now a problem if you were to just use this device and grow it bigger, just so we get one kilogram. Um, the problem is leakage current. So you have, if you have a bulk, a bigger bulk, you have much more leakage current. And that's also our hypothesis is that most of what we are seeing here is leakage current. Um, if you grow thicker, uh, the leakage current would be larger. Um, well, of course, also the dark matter rate would be larger, but it's not uh, scaling linearly. So the, the leakage would be uh, rising faster. And so a way to grow faster would be to try to understand and to control the leakage current. So understanding its sources, um, where it's all coming from and mitigating that, that sources. So we are working on that and we are making, we're having small breakthroughs here and there. And so in that regard, there is perspective. Um, but one could also ask the question whether we just, do we really just want to um, make this one here bigger, so grow it until we reach um, our uh, snow lab um, size detectors, or maybe we just uh, start to think of making just many, many, many more of these uh, small ones and fill our, so maybe we can make them in, in horizontal space, we can make them larger, but not growing them in the bulk, and then just have many of those in, in uh, in the cryostat. So I think um, just growing it bigger is uh, is making progress. And there's uh, there's actually good hope right now. Um, but it is also very wise to just uh, think of alternate um, geometries, I would say. Yeah. OK, thank you. It's very challenging. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have another question regarding this plot. How, so how you improve from R1 to R2? What change maybe you mentioned and I'm, I'm lost it no i i didn't mention um so it is um a, a couple of things um so it's it's the layout and basically it's um yeah fair part let me actually see um the mask uh, design that is on there um i can't show you i don't have the two in in parallel so i can't really show you um, that's one big, big difference. So uh, the amount of sensors you are having um, and how they are placed. Okay, thanks. Any other comments or questions? Okay, doesn't seem so. So thank you again, Belina, for this very, very nice talk. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks again Thank for the invitation. You.